throughout Australia, but I would also like to acknowledge the trust, traditional custodians all around the world and the many people that have made it here physically and those of us that are here in spirit. I'd like to recognise their enduring connection to land, sea and waters, to their country, to dream time, to spirituality, and we'd like to pay respects to the elders past and present and to say that sovereignty was never ceded. And although the referendum in Australia was lost, that certainly is not the end of the walk, uh, walk for justice. And uh, as we heard before from Sheila Watt Clotier, indigenous wisdom is the medicine the world needs. So I just thought we'd start on that foot. Now, thank you for coming here to our session, which we now have the backdrop for. Um, unlocking the legal sector in law associations, adding momentum to the transition. Here today, we have a number of wonderful uh, lawyers and people in the legal and information space, and um, we're really here to add value and some practical bolt-ons that you can take away from this COP, um, and certainly not leave things to the next COP, but take it with you for the year ahead. So, um, to my left, we have Dr. Fabiano de Andrade Correa, he is the co-chair of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Laws, Climate Change Law Specialist Group, and is a qualified lawyer from Brazil. Uh, to his left, we have Olivia Tatoletti. She is a senior lawyer at Legal Response International, which is an NGO that provides free legal support to developing countries about the international climate change regime and its implementation at a domestic level. And I should say, I met Olivia uh, this year in Bonn. She was in the cafeteria with a stack of documents about this big, um, issuing advice or providing free legal advice to I don't even know how many delegates, um, and she was doing it at that point solo, so absolute shout out. Um, to my right is Tejas Rao, PhD student um, and research assistant at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy, uh, the CERNG researcher at the development, develop, Department of Land Economy at the University of Cambridge, and he is a manager at the Centre for International Sustainable Development Law. Um, to his right, we have Achinthi Vithanaje. She is the Associate Director of Environmental Law Programs and Adjunct Law Professor at Pace University and Co-Chair of the American Bar Association's Section on Environment, Energy and Resources, International Environment and Resources Law Committee. Now, to her right, we have... Uh, a guest um, who is not originally on this panel, but who is going to give us some amazing insights into a fantastic um, initiative called Net Zero Tracker. Uh, her name is Camilla Heeslop uh, from Oxford, and you might wonder putting Oxford and Cambridge on the same panel. Didn't think about it at the time, but teamwork makes the dream work. So without further ado, I might just ask Camilla to give us some information about Net Zero Tracker and how it might assist lawyers, and then we'll go into the panel proper. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Um, so much to my parents' dismay, but my great relief, I've recently recovered from being a corporate lawyer, and now I'm the co dial lead at the Net Zero Tracker. And at the Tracker, we're asking two questions. The first is, uh, who has a Net Zero target? And if they have one, how robust is that target? And we're asking this of countries, regions, cities, and the biggest publicly listed companies in the world. And um, we have about 4,000 entities that we track across about 18 metrics. So you can imagine that's quite a lot of data. And what we find in that data is absolutely what you would expect. We're making progress, but there's still a, a lot of hard work to go. So maybe to illustrate that, in December 2020, 7% of global emissions were covered by a net zero target that was either in policy or in law. By June of this year, it's now 75% of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions covered by uh, a national target in policy or in law. At a corporate level, we've just gone over half of the Forbes 2000 um, having a net zero target of some description. That's really amazing and really illustrates how we've seen net zero grow across the global economy. However, there's still a lot of work to be done. So at a national level, we're still seeing a lot of um, company, uh, countries not really 
being clear as to how exactly they intend to get to net zero. So we saw this in the emissions gap report. They're also not clear about how they intend to use carbon dioxide removal, for example. And then at a corporate level, we, in June 20, uh, of this year, we uh, released our net zero stock take report, and we assessed how many companies were um, reaching the starting line criteria of the UN Race to Zero. That's the minimum procedural requirement just to join the UN Race to Zero. And only 4% of, I mean, of companies had met that criteria. That's astonishingly low. Um, so I'm hoping that we can continue to build on this transition and you'll hear more from the rest of the panel. But just to say, if you're a lawyer, I hope you can use the tracker because it's very useful for seeing in jurisdictions what the climate law is, or if you're working on ESG, what companies are doing. I should also point to, um, I'm sorry, this is an Oxford thing, sorry Cambridge. Um, the Oxford, uh, reg, uh, we have a regulation hub on net zero and we track regulations on net zero across antitrust and all sorts of things, very helpful as well. Um, and I'll stop there, thank you for having me. Thank you, and just quickly, the, the chat, GPT function. Exactly. I've seen both banners. Could you quickly give us info on that too? Sure. So we built our own chat uh, GPT, and it essentially pulls on all of our data. So you can type in, what does Walmart's net zero target look like? And it'll spit it out and answer. It also pulls from the UN expert group's recommendations um, and from our reports. So it can give you more of an idea of what it means to have a robust net zero target. Thanks, mate. Super useful for lawyers. Um, saves time. And that is important. Thank you so much, Camilla. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You are released. Thank you. <laughs> um, so there you go. Already one or two very practical things you can take away from this session of things you might not have known already. Um, so as we get started, um, it actually might be helpful to scene set. So. This is my second COP. Um, at COP26, a number of lawyers went looking for some law sessions and kind of accidentally met each other outside a law session and, and said, wow, how few law sessions are there on the side event list? And they all agreed, yes, there weren't that many, um, despite the amazing work for that the um, Centre for International Sustainable Development Law and um, Climate Law and Governance Day does every year. So this is separate. But <laughs> on the official list, there weren't that many. And so they cooked up a plan that next year those bar associations and other lawyers would see some more events. And I joined IBA last year. We applied for a Blue Zone event in collaboration with the American Bar Association, the Brazilian Bar Association, also known as OEB, and the Law Society of England and Wales, and we were successful in getting our session. And it's the first time that we're aware of that bar associations have done that. But if you know better, please tell me because I want to know the facts. Um, this is our second year, and we're picking up momentum along the way. I can see in the audience some friends from other bar associations that have been on that journey with us. So a special shout out to you, you know who you are. Um, but it's not been that long that bar associations themselves have been really engaged in this space. And what we've seen over the last 10 years is that, or a little bit longer, I should say, uh, a number of resolutions being issued in quite a rapid pace from about 2019 to now, although there were some earlier resolutions and um, Canada, their first resolution I think was in 2011, or there might have even been an earlier resolution. <laughs> Selena and Marie Claire, you will correct me. Um, but there was a real uptick from about 2019 onwards and it has culminated in a guidance being issued by the Law Society of England and Wales specifically to its solicitors on the impact of climate change. So that's really the background and what we're here to hear from the panel about and this is the first question, it is meant to be interactive, so please lean in if you have comments. Uh, I, I want you to give your views in a dynamic way. Um, and the first question I actually might go to you first, Olivia. Why is it important for lawyers to be at COPS? LRI has been around for quite a long time. Um, I hope you're glad to see more of us here. And why, why is it necessary? Thanks, Laura. Hi, hi everyone. Yes, why lawyers should be at COP? I'm a lawyer, so of course I'm going to have a very positive response to that, to that question. The reason why, first, you know, by background, LRI is at COP is acknowledging that there is an incredi incredi incredible imbalance in power amongst delegations from the Global North and the Global South, where in the Global North, typical, typically, delegations comprise many individuals, uh, legal advisors, and for um, a good part of the Global South, 
they don't have access to this legal advice, and thus this is where LRI comes in. And so if anything, as a lawyer, you can get involved with LRI if you already have relevant expertise, either volunteering with us or if you want to gain expertise you know, by volunteering with us and, um, and coming to COPS with us once you have kind of relevant, relevant expertise. But I think in general, you know, as lawyers, we have tools as part of our training that enable us to look at society and have an impact on it. And the climate crisis, as we know, is the biggest um, is the biggest <laughs> environmental crisis and crisis, I would say, I would argue in general, that's facing global, um, globally humanity, but also the earth as, as we know it and, and other species. And so by developing our understanding as lawyers of this process and how either to make the process itself fairer for those, whether it be um, indigenous peoples, whether it be unrepresented, um, unrepresented you know, species to this process, but you know, either in that specific capacity or in how it then translates at the national level for governments, but also for those who are involved, you know, whether it's civil society or groups, political groups involved in um, climate action at the national level. And it is a very dry area and it is an area that requires, you know, sort of getting up to speed and following regularly even when you take a gap. Like I took a gap a year for, <laughs> for maternity and when you come back you have to you know, restart the wheel and re refresh yourself. So I would say there is, that's a bit of a maybe broad overview, but that mm -hmm. would be like a first, um, a first takeaway. And just to add that, I, I'm really sorry, I'm gonna have to, to leave in 10 minutes for, for in a meeting, but I have a very good colleague, also a lawyer, who will be taking over and you'll be in very good hands. <laughs> Okay, well, first of, all, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I wanted to start by thanking Lara for pulling this together and, and uh, gathering us, uh, and to thank all of you for, for being in a room full of lawyers in uh, 5, 5 p.m. by the end of COP. Uh, but don't, don't get into the stereotype. As, as was said in, to, in, a, in a previous session earlier today, I think we are here really to start or to help change the mentality uh, of seeing the law and lawyers from troublemakers and, and you know, hurdles to enablers. Uh, and, and that's a bit what we will be doing in this panel. So uh, going back to the question about why law is a cop, um, why not? <laughs> and, and I think the... Uh, <laughs> I think it maybe it, you know, the cops have grown into something much bigger, but maybe we should think about that they are first and foremost a decision-making uh, body and meeting of an international binding agreement. So I think it's only natural the lawyers should very much be here, be here to negotiate uh, the agreement and what needs to be negotiated further, but also to participate in all the, the other layers of the COP that have been evolving over these years. Uh, as Lara said, I am co-chair of the Climate Change Law Specialist Group uh, of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law. I'm also a member of CISDL and the Climate Law and Governance Initiative and a number of other initiatives that have been working now for really decades, I, I can say, uh, not only in the specific negotiation aspects of the agreement, but also on generating knowledge and understanding and advice on all the legal aspects that need to be in place so that uh, after negotiated, uh, the agreements and the decisions can be implemented and translated into an actionable action. I'll stop here for now. Uh, thanks so much, Fabiano. I'll just pick up from there so Lara doesn't have to intervene. Uh, but uh, I'm very glad to be sharing space with, with all of you today and to have this opportunity to speak to some of the things that I'm seeing in my PhD research. I investigate how lawyers come together to facilitate implementation and compliance in a nutshell. And I look at multilateral sustainable development treaties to, as examples of this, as case studies of this. And I want to respond to this question particularly from the perspective of an early career researcher who is a lawyer. Um, I think it's really important because our profession is geared up in the outside world to be competitive by nature. We compete with each other for margins and we compete for, with each other for clients. Except at COPS, you're always collaborating with each other. You're never really competing at all. And I know we'll talk, talk about this uh, a little further, but um, my initial impression for why it's important for lawyers to be at COPS is because of the fact that it creates space to trade values, 
to create conversation about values, to facilitate climate competent lawyering, as we've spoken about previously, but also to create networks of support and communities of practice within, within ourselves, to talk to each other rather than past each other, because it's far easier to talk past each other on the outside world, but over here you're forced almost in a room with each other to talk to each other. And I think that's really critical, especially from an early career perspective, because it forces you to take decisions that I don't think you'd otherwise be making. I've seen myself, for example, be lured in now. This is my third cop, and I'm, I'm sort of, I think I'm stuck here for the rest of my life. But um, I, I, would, I would just stop there. I think those networks are quite, quite critical and quite useful. And I'll pass on to Achindi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tejas. And I, I do want to echo everyone's remarks about Thanking Laura, Lara for, uh, and the International Bar Association for really pulling us all together. It's not always easy herding legal cats. Um, so I'm, I'm here from the American Bar Association, uh, but really my name is Achinti Vitanage. I am the Associate Director of Environmental Law Programs at uh, Pace Law School in New York. Uh, but under the ABA, I am a member of the Climate Change Task Force. Uh, I, I was also a co-chair of the National Environmental Law Committee, uh, and I am also a council member uh, in the Environmental Energy and Resources Law section. And for those of you who may not have, I, I mean, some of you may probably have heard of the American Bar Association, but uh, probably a lot of you don't know that it is a voluntary association, uh, and it includes lawyers, legal professionals, judges, uh, law students, and legal affiliated professionals as well. Um, and we've been having mem um, we have members and activities all over the world, in, not just in the United States. Uh, I do want to mention that in terms of like why should lawyers be at COP? Well. This is one thing that the ABA has kind of recognized in a little while ago. Um, even before, the, before even the cops were thinking about, the ABA has been uh, demonstrating a really strong commitment towards the leadership role of lawyers, judges, and legal professionals, uh, particularly in just, not just in climate change, but also in sustainable development as an overall thing. Um, and the ABA has adopted over 12 policy resolutions that kind of focus in this space, um, dating back to 1991. And uh, there's been lots more recent policies coming up uh, with respect to climate action uh, through legal, policy, financial, and educational mechanisms. Um, I'm really honored to be participating in this dialogue uh, with these wonderful <laughs> panelists today, uh, particularly in terms of looking at the role of the legal profession in that context of the linkages of climate justice, rule of law, uh, and so forth. Uh, now, in terms of one other, I just want to kind of focus again on why lawyers at COPS. Uh, we as legal and justice professionals, whether it's the bar associations that we're part of or law societies, we kind of really position well to drive change and power um, and to do so amongst a range of stakeholders because that is what we do. We are constantly working with other stakeholders. And we serve in so many roles to that extent too, right? We, we not only do we are helping in the drafting and the negotiating um, elements of it, but we're advising, we're mediating. We're also trying to kind of bridge that gap within between complex scientific data and applying it to legal and policy mechanisms. Uh, so that part is really important. And we work to do to improve environmental and resource governance. Uh, we enhance access to justice. We provide that legal empowerment to low income and the, um, vulnerable communities and help try to solve and provide climate solutions and strategies in accordance with whatever international laws are there, what norms are, what standards are involved. Um, so we should be at COPS, and we should be making a real big statement here. Uh, I think one thing I am proud to say is that ABA delegates have participated in these COPS for a while. We've been at COP26 and 27, and now at 28 here. Um, and so we really hope to continue that trajectory and continue to be collaborating with our international bar associations and our affiliated professionals. Um, organizations to really continue that trajectory and build up on it. Awesome. Thank you. And yeah, absolutely echo what you're saying. And um, I think similar to Tejas, like, we'll be here forever because I just don't think I could live with myself if we weren't. Um, that's not to say that, you know, individually we all need the mic, but we all are trained in a certain way with a certain skill set, and that's what's going to drive things because, you know, the optimistic side of me says law is a living, evolving thing that helps enable every single thing in the world to happen. And I look at NDCs, and my friend who's a partner at DLA Piper 
uh, Dr. Sharon Fitzgerald, 10 a.m. She said, NDCs are like shopping lists for lawyers. There is a matter in every single dot point. There are opportunities endlessly for legal work and clever lawyering and sparky people to jump in, roll their sleeves up and do their best to help. And so that's where I would say, you know, absolutely stepping away from the stereotype of law. I would love to see a world where in the future lawyers are looked at where people run towards us and not are frightened of us because we have some of the key solutions. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on where you sit, and I will get you to say fortunately by the end of this, it is the fact that there is a lawyer behind every major decision. You can't draft major financial agreements without lawyers. You can't get money out of a trust without lawyers. You can't build major projects in greenfield renewable structures without lawyers. You can't amend uh, town planning regulations to enable investment without lawyers. I mean, I would go on, but I'm, actually, I'm not going to because I was, I was speaking on the fly there. But you get my point. We are needed everywhere, and that's where the idea of climate competent lawyering comes in. Because obviously, with everyone with the Blue Zone badge, we are here in the room. To the people listening online, thank you. Um, but it's very difficult to get these Blue Zone badges. And as someone unfamiliar with the UNFCCC process until relatively recently, it was quite a scarring experience to try and get this badge. Um, and so I personally see bar associations as a necessary bridge between those within the COP bubbles and the UNFCCC process and all of the domestic lawyers on the ground that are there to do the work and to advise their clients. It is one of many bridges, but a necessary bridge that I think has, you know, not been in the spotlight enough, and that's on us, but we are here now. So with this idea of climate competent lawyering, it's come up. Um, I'd be interested to see what you all think it means in practice, taking into consideration the involvement from climate conscious lawyering that we've been talking about to climate competent lawyering. And just on that, the IBA in 2020 issued a climate crisis statement uh, issued by our president of the day, which called upon bar associations and law organisations to take a stance on climate in the sense of what your professional obligations require you to do based on the best available science, very much based in fact and not of opinion. What does the IPCC require us to do as a profession, taking into consideration these evolving risks? And that was then used by a number of bar associations who were having trouble m taking movement on this space. So um, if anyone wants to jump in. Maybe, maybe I can say something so, um, <laughs> before I leave. Um, absolutely agree with what you've said, and I think that role is is really important. Something that also we notice, you know, because LRI is based in in the UK, so working within a common law system, is that the the idea of pro bono of giving back to society, what you, you know, aspects of your work and and your learning, is really ingrained in the culture of law firms and barrister chambers, academics, and that's something we hugely hugely benefit benefit from. At some point, there is going to be more and more conflicts of interest, unfortunately, where you know those lawyers, particularly in private practice, might have to recuse themselves from giving some pro bono legal advice to us and, and others, where that conflicts still with some of the interests of their existing clients, which we can imagine range from oil and gas and, and others. And perhaps there could be some guidance from <laughs> law societies, bar associations, on how to weigh that, how to weigh that conflict of interest, I think we could very well welcome that. Thank you. Roger that. Putting it on the to-do list. <laughs> um, what else? Um, oh, okay. Um, well, I can chime in quickly here. Uh, so, very ABA entities have been supporting initiatives, um, and particularly some like projects to support capacity building. Uh, in particular, in terms of furthering climate objectives and implementation strategies. What I definitely want to highlight is the work of one of our specialized sections, and that's the sec ABA's Environment, Energy, and Resources section. Um, we've been trying to provide programs, publications, and special projects to specifically educate lawyers and legal professionals on what it means to be climate-conscious lawyers, uh, and also talking about like ethics and resp professional responsibilities, trying to make that connection, uh, trying to develop that connection out even more because of the, nothing has really been said about it, so just focus, uh, trying to delve that out more. Uh, 
engage awareness, building awareness of climate law policies, energy regulation, looking at climate-related financial risk, management practices and disclosures, um, and of course, any kind of emerging trends that are coming out in relation to carbon capture, carbon trade, um, removal, storage, and really how to get to that net zero, um, net zero figure. I'm also uh, one of the uh, founding chair, co-chairs of the Environmental Law Student Societies Network. So this is a network that kind of tries to build together a different environmental law student societies around the country. Uh, and one of the things that we did was with members of the Climate Change Task Force of the Environmental Law Section, we had them present to uh, the Environmental Law Student Society Network to kind of tell them, okay, this is what's happening on the international stage. All these bar associations are coming up with these ideas about what it means to be a climate conscious lawyer uh, and to try and get them to start thinking about that. Um, in addition to that, I mean, I get part of climate, con going down this path, you, you sort of include elements of human rights, the rule of law, all of this kind of comes into that um, fora. And uh, the ABA Center for Human Rights, uh, they have a justice defenders program which supports environmental defenders, land and climate activists uh, who face harassment and threats and criminalization and retaliation for their legitimate uh, rights work. Um, there's also a young lawyers division within the ABA that does work with disaster legal services, uh, specifically in partnership with some of our state bar associations because the ABA is on the national level, right? And then there's all the different states in the United States have their own state bars. So we try to coordinate with them as well uh, to provide work that um, uh, what uh, Olivia was talking about, pro bono, do, do some work on a pro bono basis, specifically where uh, folks have been impacted by disasters like hurricanes, wildfires, and floods, and what the, the, there's a, a legal role there. There's a role for the lawyer to be involved there. Um, so I might leave it at that. Awesome. And um, no, no, and uh, just to plug another practical thing for you to take away, um, a dear friend, John Dernbach, and two colleagues wrote this book. It's called Sustainability Essentials, A Leadership Guide for Lawyers. Google it. Um, if you want a copy, um, I'm sure the internet will allow you to purchase one. Um, but if... <laughs> But um, also please get in contact with John. It's an amazing resource and there's something in there for everyone, whether you're a corporate lawyer or in-house or government or your a own practitioner or a lawyer on the high street. Or a law student. Or a law student, absolutely. It's incredibly useful. I'll hold it up to the camera. Oh, there we go. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, send it to John afterwards. Yeah. Um, Lara, have... yeah, yeah, please. Oh, I... It was John Kerry who once said, you are all climate lawyers now, whether you want it or not. Uh, and with that, I wanted to just, uh, just say that, you know, whether you were a lawyer working on human rights or you were advising corporations on infrastructure uh, development, climate change brings a series of new risks uh, to, to this profession. Uh, but perhaps us in this room take for granted that probably the vast majority of lawyers out there have not a good idea about climate change, about the legal regime. So yeah. I think with competent lawyer, lawyering as uh, responding to the challenges presented by climate change comes a big need to upskill uh, lawyers across the board. First really about climate change is, right, and really there's still so much doubt and questioning and, and challenges to, to this very reality that we accept as true and, and take it as, as a given. Uh, then of course into what the actual uh, climate change legal regime is at international level. Many lawyers across the world would not be uh, you know, fully equipped to understand and, and, and operate it uh, correctly. And then on, last but not least of course on how climate change affects the various areas of, of, uh, of legal legal issues, but you know, even going beyond, of course, I'm very happy actually that Lara is bringing us together beyond the uh, strict remit of bar associations. I myself haven't been a practicing lawyer for many years. Uh, we have academic researchers here as well. So whether I think you are you know, a judge or somebody working on legislative matters to a practicing lawyer to a researcher, there's really a need for the the, the legal profession to come together and exchange perspectives and skills in, in this area. 
Hi, uh, just to introduce myself, sorry. <laughs> Not Olivia. Uh, my name is Sarah Hill-Smith. Um, I work at Clyde & Co. and I'm volunteering with, with LRI at, at COP, COP28. I'm um, just coming in on the education piece. Um, what we've witnessed, or what I've witnessed at my firm, and I'm sure lots of other lawyers have witnessed at their firms, is that often the, the upskilling and the training on climate change related matters is actually coming from the more junior lawyers mm -hmm. who are having to upskill and train their seniors. And that's a bit of an inverse of the traditional relationship that you have in law firms. I mean, sometimes it's quite daunting, but it's a very, very necessary uh, conversation that needs to happen. Um, and addressing that and to recognize that and to, to facilitate that, um, I'm part of, I'm a co-chair of, of the um, stewardship committee of a new initiative called Legal Voices for the Future. Um, it's a, a voluntary initiative that brings together young lawyers and also young at heart lawyers. Um, and we meet once a month online and uh, in person in London. And we discuss and learn together about climate change related topics and how it intersects with the law. Um, so we have a presentation and then a, a Q&A with someone who works in the field and then we have a creative content session. Um, and it's a really brilliant way uh, to upskill uh, lawyers and it's a great way to meet like-minded like people. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in hearing more about it, please do grab me afterwards um, and I, I'll be happy to talk more about it. Amazing. Thank you so much. That was such a nimble swift I didn't even see it um, you're exactly right about that at my law firm in Australia I was giving our general counsel as only a few years qualified um, I was giving general counsel um, the CPD session and delivering it on climate litigation um, and I was the only non-partner to be doing that um, I think that was also just reflective of um, my Enthusiasm, it's a word that has followed me for many a time. But you've got to dive right in because if you're there um, and you know, then they want to hear from you. And actually my experience with partners is that they're very keen. Um, when uh, certain key decisions came down, I had a partner run into my office and go, what do you think the client wants to know about that? And I was like, well, here's what I know about it. What do you think? And there was a real learning and exchange of their 30 plus years of commercial experience with my knowledge of the, the case itself and, and how it fit internationally. And so, you know, for younger lawyers, um, there's such power. But I also acknowledge that in saying that, we need stronger senior leadership because there has to be a tone at the top. Um, I have seen, I think, seven panels so far at COP where we had a lot of older people talking, and as they should, they're usually quite wise, talking about what they thought the youth wanted. Um, and I just felt like screaming, oh my God, we're here, you know, just ask. It will save you from guessing, you know? Um, and so I'm actually delighted to see this panel, not on purpose, um, is fantastic. Um, so with that, um, collaboration amongst various stakeholders as we were talking about is crucial for effective governance across the board, good governance structures, which helps enable the just transition and, and live it, live it and breathe it. How can academia, legal practitioners, international organisations and everything in between work together more seamlessly in between COPs um, to further this, to bring, each out, bring out the best in each other and bring out solutions? Because the power of the example is so strong in, in setting pathways and giving some form of security to us. So, Pages? Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. So. Um, I, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that we all bring with us a specific set of skills into every conversation and a specific set of lived experience into every single conversation that we're having, including this, the diversity on this panel, for example. And one of the things that we see that gets ignored frequently is this idea of an epistemic trading zone. The idea that when you're having a conversation, your lived experience and your expertise is something that you're continuously passing on to the person that you're speaking with. This is something that continuously takes place at COPs. Whenever lawyers speak to each other, when we're sharing this panel, for example, we're all talking about things that we've seen or we've heard or we've encountered over the course of the COP that contributes to the overall knowledge sharing goal that we may have. But when we, when we look at collaboration specifically across these different stakeholders, I think it's really important to acknowledge that what happens when these epistemic trading zones get created or when we actually speak to each other as lawyers is that we allow for the formation of legal vernacular much faster than it would have otherwise taken place. We allow legal vernacular to move from one context into another context 
more seamlessly than it would have otherwise taken place. I'll give you a quick example of this, and I think that um, the easiest one for me is to pinpoint to one from my current research, which is implementation of the word compliance. Historically, these, have, these phrases have been used interchangeably, but now it means very different things. But the implementation piece is one that is moved across the environmental, the multilateral environmental agreements, using the same text across the different agreements, and also across domestic contexts in more than four continents already, um, using the same piece of text within domestic legislation and within the NDCs as well. And that cross fertilization I don't think is an accident. It's very clear if you look at who's drafted those documents and which legal teams are part of drafting those documents that they have had calls and conversations with each other. There's a paper trail that also evidences this. So I'm not speaking hypothetically and conjecturing some, some story. And I think it's, it's really critical that these communities of practice that support each other and speak to each other are ones that uh, integrate academia with lawyers who are in practice, with lawyers who are in international organizations, with judges even, as, as Fabiano said, because that dialogue is one that can only take place with a variety of lived experiences, and the more contexts you have, the more people you have using the same vernacular over and over again. And Lara frequently says, more is more, and I think more is more, especially in these contexts. So I, I would say that uh, speaking up, and especially as an early career researcher, for me, I've been telling other early career researchers that we just need to be confident in ourselves. You do have certain pieces of lived experience and you do actually have some expertise that you will bring into every conversation that you have. So when you do that, you're creating that trading zone and that buffer zone for people to actually take away from you. And I think that that's, that's fairly critical. So give people space to talk about, about their lived experiences and talk about your own every, every chance you get. So beautifully said. Just, thank you. Um, I, just clap I, I, th I think I'm going to pick up on the the diversity point that you were making, and I, you know, we we talk a lot about cooperation and the need for global cooperation, but we really must make sure that we firmly embed qualities like diversity, equity, and inclusion activities within the climate agenda, but also in any kind of capacity building activities that we do, like we were just talking about all these ways of how to build legal capacity, just to always keep in mind that need to um, need to spread it out, spread that out with diversity. Um, one example that comes to mind with uh, the American Bar Association, because that's the hat that I've got on here, um, for several years at the United Nations, uh, the ABA has been holding these education events and discussions uh, that focus on climate action, uh, particularly addressing topics like climate justice, uh, impacts on indigenous peoples, land use and ownership rights, um, climate and human rights, corporate policies and practices and how they are intersecting, um, and the intersection of climate and the rule of law. And We've gone so far as with co-sponsoring events on climate justice with organizations like the International Development Law Organizations has been around a lot too in a lot of our events. Um, so I think it's really important that we continue to build on these efforts to build a global community um, on the legal and justice sectors focused on mutual support and resilience at least between ourselves but also those organizations that contribute to diversity and equity. Um, so back with my LRI hat on. Capacity building is at the core of what Legal Response International does. So we obviously build capacity and provide support during international climate negotiations like COP. We're also at the meetings of the subsidiary bodies in Bonn, which takes place between May and June. But in between negotiations, it's not all uh, holidays for the LRI people. Um, they work really hard to build capacity. So that's training, uh, training delegates on, on you know, how to better represent their national interests during climate negotiations. Um, for people who've never been to a COP before, it's briefing them on what goes on at these COPs. Because to the outside world, they're quite obtuse and they're quite hard to understand. Um, so it's, it's providing crucial training in that respect. It's also understanding and working with different countries on what their national interests are. So I was at a meeting yesterday with a minister from an African country, and they specified that they were particularly concerned about Article 6. Um, and they wanted help with their, um, you know, their regulations relating to carbon markets and then also uh, to Red Plus. So then we tailor our capacity building to those, to those national interests so that when those, when those ministers and when those lawyers representing that country come to COP, the next COP, 
They know what to do, they're better prepared, and they're ready to represent their national interest. And that's all in the spirit of leveling the playing field, making sure that everyone is well represented, mm -hmm. Um, and can articulate their views effectively, um, effectively with, a, with a chance to, uh, you know, propose their, uh, put forth their um, best interests. I mean, I would just love it if you did that for every bar association around the world as just mandatory CPD. Like, this is what cops are, yeah. you know. The ba and I mean, you, you've all done training as well. This is the basics of the Paris Agreement. Like, take nothing, you know, don't assume anything. That was actually in my first year of my grad year at my law firm, number one rule the managing partner said is, do not assume anything um, about anything. And we were like, oh my God, okay. You know, how far back does that go? But it goes back to knowledge that lawyers have. You wanna say something? Yeah, I might actually just wear a different hat and plug. Uh, so we have the, the Democratizing Education for Global Sustainability and Justice program at the University of Cambridge, and I have both the visiting chair in Sustainable Development Law and Policy and the program coordinator for Democratizing Education in Global Sustainability and Justice with us in the room. Um, and we celebrated just earlier with a lot of our learners right behind, right on this stage. And we've got four courses. We've got Key Essentials on the Paris Agreement, Sustainable Development and the Law as one of the courses that we offer. And that's already reached over 2,000 learners in countries all around the world world whom we have with us here who are actually getting that knowledge about the basics of the cops and we are also able to invite them to join the climate law capacity registry where, with the climate law and governance initiative um, and we would just encourage everyone to become a part of these communities and these networks and access this next run of courses if you've not already uh, which should be advertised fairly soon and then running in the spring and fall so I've done them and they're really good <laughs> <laughs> same <laughs> Actually, that's how my journey started with all of this. And I would say, in a more simple way, our path forward in all of this, I think, um, and please don't mistake my smile for the fury and the emotions that I have about this issue, um, because COP is a roller coaster, as we know. Um, but it's also about friendship and making friends and making those really firm connections. And I'm here because I randomly went to my homeland in Greece and did an international climate law course that Professor Koronia Sega was helping teach because 20 years before that, she had done a course at that exact same place. And I met an amazing amount of people, including the institutes that we've been talking about today, and was kind of engulfed in this community where for the first time ever, I didn't have to explain why climate was an important thing to be considering. And the mental load that that took off me was amazing, and, but there are a lot of lawyers around the world with that load, a lot of lawyers fighting literally with their lives on this issue. And so the more we can skill up every lawyer in the world to have the absolute basics at hand for anything that any government ever asks of them, that would be the dream. And in terms of systemic change, for example, uh, in Brazil, and I speak with uh, my dear friend Leticia Campos Mello in mind, who can't be here, who is our representative from OIB, which is one of the four labels behind us. Um, she's the Secretary General of the um, Foreign Affairs Committee of the OIB, and uh, the OIB is nearly unique in, in that every lawyer in Brazil must be a member of OIB. There are 1.4 million lawyers registered with OIB, 1.4 million lawyers. So that's sit in. That's a lot of talking. That's a lot. It's a big country. <laughs> yeah. And within the Brazilian constitution, and actually, I should pass over to the Brazilian lawyer here. Um, in the constitution, the OIB specifically is named and tasked with the defense of the rule of law and has special powers to bring action against the government if they feel that that rule of law is being threatened. Um, and I, I, I have not seen an equivalent bar association con uh, with mention in the constitution that I can think of, but if you know of, please let us know. So imagine if it became part of a bar exam in Brazil to understand SDGs. That's just all bar association work. Um, that's the systemic change I think we need to be thinking about beyond our own yard or backyard as we say in Australia and every bar association and law society is modelled differently but that's the kind of way that each of you whether you're an academic or a student or a practicing lawyer which is the more obvious pathway can get involved in a bar association because not all are taking um, steps towards climate but certainly there are members that want to so add your voice um, 
we've got still about 45 minutes. So unless anyone had any comments on that, I'm happy to ask the next question. I just want to plug some brilliant <laughs> resources. Um, so LRI has loads of very uh, kind of clear and informative explainers on key topics. So Article 6, uh, loss and damage, global stock take. Uh, we've got briefing notes on all of these. We are at every COP with them. We, this is the pile of books that, that was mentioned earlier that's sitting next to Olivia. Um, we hand them out. We've got guides to the Paris Agreement, but we also have an app. So if you come and scan my little QR code afterwards, you can download the app. It's the Paris Agreement A, A to uh, Z. And it's got all the guidance related to the different, different articles. So I have a few left. I know it's pretty late in the day, but if you want one, please come grab one later. I see a hand. I feel like I should be throwing them out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, why not at this point? More is more. Um, but if, yeah, if leave them on the corner even and people come up and grab them. I should add that if I take my hat off for a second as an ABA, but uh, as, a, as a professor, I've actually got some students who are working with LRI. Uh, they're my advanced international environmental law students, and they're working with LRI this semester, and they've found these uh, fact sheets very helpful in terms oh, of when they're as a starting point as well. So. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Fabiano, but I mean, we can all weigh in. Um, as chair of the climate change law specialist group within the WCEL, um, what strategies have you seen from that, I guess, broader specialist group? Uh, what strategies have been most effective in promoting that policy coherence um, in environmental law, but more generally in the work that you have been doing, and how are you seeing collaboration be made in terms of the ICJ opinions, and, and why should like more commercial lawyers be, be thinking about that? Uh, let me start by perhaps picking up on something that was being mentioned by many in the panel, which is the power of networks. Yeah. Uh, the World Commission on Environmental Law and the Climate Change Law Specialist Group, which is a specialist group within WCEL, is first and foremost a network of environmental lawyers globally. It is, to my knowledge, the largest, actually, network of environmental law around the world. And I, I think there's an intrinsic interest in such kind of collaboration that can bring different parts of the legal profession together. And I wanted to point out two in particular. The first is really the, uh, the power and the benefits that I see in this, uh, in the network in itself as a reference point for lawyers to come together, but also to see peers doing something that maybe they would like to see. We know that across the world, uh, working on climate change is a challenge for many lawyers that, you know, don't have a starting point or, or cannot take part in negotiations like this. So I think probably, uh, for instance, for somebody early career that wants to step into this field, being part of something and having the feeling that it's possible that there are things being done out there is, is probably inspiring and encouraging. Whereas for a more seasoned lawyer, I think it provides uh, an excellent space to share what is being done and, and to get in touch with others who might benefit from this, uh, from the expertise. And the second point is, is really this, uh, this space that promotes, again, uh, a cross-fertilization from different points of the legal profession, from judges to practicing lawyers to people like me who work in the, you know, with international organizations. I think there's so much that we can learn from each other, but we might take for granted. You know, for instance, uh, a practicing lawyer probably can learn a lot from uh, negotiators people that are negotiators but also have a legal background here at COP, whereas we here at COP should probably uh, not lose sight of the experience and the perspectives that, that a practicing lawyer can bring into you know, providing uh, insights into how to design things that can actually be implementable and don't become you know, unachievable or uh, not very well operating agreements and, and decisions. And the same for you know, somebody like a judge who might benefit a lot from what is being discussed here and so on and so forth. So WCEL and the Climate Change Law Specialist Group, in, in addition uh, to undertaking projects and uh, uh, promoting publications and, and meetings, we have also set up a network that is called the Climate Change Law Network that, brings, uh, that aims first and foremost as providing 
uh, uh, an, an ongoing space for exchange to continue here conversations like this that we are having at COP, that we might have in, in other events, and uh, that provides really, I think, opportunities for all these cross fertilizations to happen. Uh, you, you asked me the question about the ICJ, but I could maybe come back about that later. We can or come back, yeah. Uh, if anyone else. Yeah, if I, could, if I could speak to the value of these networks just from a different lens, I think, um, Fabiano, you're completely right. I think the early career advantage of joining these networks is significant. But there's also this importance of the accessibility of these networks that I think the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law in particular and, and the DGSJ courses that I was mentioning earlier are accessible to everyone irrespective of where they are because there's no application fee for them. The IUCN membership, for example, is free of cost. Even the DGSJ courses are offered owing to a generous donation are able to be offered free of cost to learners all around the world. And the networks that people join when they are this accessible are often the networks that are more accessed and more leaned on um, rather than networks that are high income or middle income and you have to pay an application fee to get in and then you have to pay a retainer every year to stay mm -hmm. as a part of that organization. And I think that's especially critical for enabling this access to this network from a, for a range of people around the world who may not make it to the physical space that is the COP or may not make it to the intersessional bodies that meet in Bonn because they don't have a Schengen visa. Mm -hmm. and, and these small mobility issues that I think um, that, that, that networks especially can almost either frustrate or foster. And I see a lot of networks now trying to become more accessible and enable people to connect over social media and stay in touch with their peers on the ground. And that leads to greater cross-fertilization than I think anything else. Um, the other part I want to touch on is the role of these networks in cross-fertilization and not repeating processes. So we've got three, I mean, uh, out of the Rio convention, out of the Rio conference, we had three treaties come out and I focus on, on looking across the three. So I look at uh, climate change, biodiversity, and the one that's the most ignored, which is desertification. And the part that people often don't realize is the amount of thought that goes into actually creating these implementation and compliance systems or trying to create tools that lawyers domestically can utilize in order to take these into actions domestically. Um, and the, the problem with not having networks or the problem with not talking to each other is the possibility of replicating or starting from scratch. And with the plastics negotiation that's ongoing right now, I think there's, um, there's, we're currently awaiting the implementation and compliance text from that, but there is a hope that that will take away from Paris rather than starting from scratch. And, and I know the amount of work that the IUCN in general has been doing to encourage that process. So I would, I would just say that, that that network, that's my two points for the networks are just ensuring that they're accessible and ensuring that they are actually sharing the information that is critical to ensure non-repetition and greater cross fertilization. So. It's a really great point about duplication. We don't have time for that. Yeah. Uh, and it confuses people and it confuses members that have signed up to pledges. It's something that we see in the corporate space quite a bit. Um, there's been a number of pledges and initiatives that have come out in recent times. Um, and oftentimes law, law firms will, will sign up to one or two and then no more and really try and do that well. But if you flood the market with different initiatives, it, it gets quite complicated. And it reminds me of also talking about another great resource and something to think about is the Net Zero Lawyers Alliance, which was formed after GFANS, after COP26. And their goal really is to, as Georgie, who's the CEO, Georgie, Georgina Beasley, CEO of Net Zero Lawyers Alliance, the dream is so that they're no longer needed and they can close shop that they have facilitated that capacity build across commercial lawyers around the world to a point where they are no longer needed. Uh, and I think that's actually quite a wonderful thing um, to inbuild and end stop. But, um, and they have used and utilised, and shout out to Cambridge, the Hughes Hall Climate Law Atlas, which is a hugely, hugely useful tool that I would urge all of you to look at, which is mapping out <laughs> seemingly every conceivable area of law and understanding where climate impacts that and where the triple planetary crisis impacts that area of law. And as someone who started their career in a law firm, hugely useful to me to say, our partners over here have a look at this and digest. Our partners over here have a look and digest. Partners over here have a look and digest. Client have a look and digest. And this is 
um, yeah, shout out to the team that built that up um, because it's also what NZLA used to educate their members. So another initiative to take stock of. Um, does anyone have any comments about that? ICJs, ICJ, well, can we hear a bit about that? So, sorry, the question was, the three advisory opinions that are coming down will, we hope, significantly clarify the scope of obligations that states have. Um, how do we, what would be the anchor point to make that relevant for commercial lawyers who are brokering huge deals that have huge impact on the climate? How do we bridge that gap? What are we saying? I'm happy to start throwing some thoughts. Uh, yeah. and, and just perhaps even taking a step back, I think this, the advisory opinion of the ICJ is such a great example of collaboration across the board, right? It, we heard about it this morning for those who might have been connected to this room, how it started really with a youth group going around with an idea and finding a means to, to deliver it all the way to the highest courts of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, from, from my perspective, I think that the real value of, of the ICJ advisory opinion, as we know that it's in itself, not a, it doesn't legally provide a legally binding uh, judgment mm -hmm. on, on any country, but I think it will provide such a fundamental uh, step forward in the understanding across the board about what the Paris Agreement really is and what, uh, what can be expected uh, moving forward on this. this as you know, it's not easy to understand the Paris Agreement. It's quite sui generis if you think about it in the way that it's drafted, in the implementation, through the whole N NDC process. Is it legally binding? Is it not? For us, it might seem obvious again, but for many people across the board, it's really not. You know, I, I also teach sometimes, uh, and I, I keep uh, getting these kind of questions. So uh, I hope that the outcome of the ICJ advisory opinion uh, is, is going really to explain that the Paris Agreement, despite the way it operates, it actually is a legally binding agreement and it entails not only procedural obligations of submission of information, but also a certain standard of conduct and due, dil due diligence that affects not only states, but also you know, uh, stakeholders across the board, really, on, uh, uh, on, on what, uh, what could be the legal consequences of, uh, of not changing uh, their game, really, Helping the collective effort that needs to take place in, in you know this this huge task of uh, moving towards a low uh, low emissions development pathway, mm -hmm. and and for people for instance in, in in a company, they might think that they don't have anything to do with this. Uh, I think it, it will become more clear you know all all these legal obligations and, and standards that that uh, that arise from Paris really. You okay. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, just a bit on, on what I think it's going to do for corporate lawyers especially and the way I think it's going to impact the legal profession. Uh, but before I do so, uh, we just celebrated the Global Leadership Awards and two of our laureates are Advocate Professor Margareta Weverinke Singh and Advocate Professor Payam Akhavan, both of whom helped take the voices of those specific youth and the voices of current and future generations all the way up to the world courts. And actually starting from the classroom and taking it forward, I think, is something that's ex extremely inspirational. But um, the, I, I think the ICJ advisory opinion and in general, the ITLOS and Inter-American Court, if they complement each other successfully, they will have the collective impact of clarifying states' obligations in a manner that I think is extremely helpful to the legal profession, mm -hmm. which responds and reacts much quicker to judgments, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not we think it's binding or not. Uh, we we um, respond and react as a profession much quicker when there is a decision of a court in any capacity mm -hmm. uh, because we take it as a signal that we should behave in a particular way. And more critically, because once those states' obligations get clarified, then there's no real room left for governments of states to escape because the articles on state responsibility will kick in. And you could potentially, you could potentially see floodgates of them being opened up to state responsibility action with other treaties, depending on which treaties get invoked, of course, mm -hmm. and the mechanisms under those treaties, which puts this sort of political momentum and pressure upon the states themselves to force corporates and force lawyers to give advice. And, and something that we've heard in a different IBA event is how when a lawyer says something or signifies that there is a climate risk in a particular way, uh, you can't escape from that anymore. And companies can't really say they didn't know about it. 
and clients can't really say that they don't have to do anything about it. So I think when you, when you have that clarity coming down from a court, the signaling virtue of that is extremely high, which is why those advisory opinions are going to play, in, in my view at least, such, a, such an important role for the years to come. So um, collaboration in that respect is probably, probably vital. And, um, I went to an event uh, where the panel were discussing the impact of the advisory opinions. So there are three advisory opinions. Tay just, just mentioned them. There's the ICJ, which is the court under the, uh, the UN's court. There's the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And there's another um, request before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Um, and what one of the panelists said in that panel was that the power of these advisory opinions is not, um, you know, it's not, diminished by the fact that they're not legally binding. The power is in their specificity. And if the tribunals and if the courts go into detail about the state's obligations, then that can then be interpreted by lawyers who are operating in a domestic context and then used to bring mm -hmm. civil actions either against the state or against corporate actors in that state. And the second point I wanted to make on this is that states have an obligation to, uh, to in, in, up to a certain extent, control the corporate entities operating in their region. Um, if you look at the principle of trans preventing transboundary harm, that enshrines that. You know, states can be found responsible for, um, for the operations and the harms caused by o o entities operating in their, in their um, jurisdiction. Um, and I had a third point, but it's escaped me, so I'll leave that there for now. No, just thinking about my time when I worked for a judge, I spent a year doing that in Australia, it's you know a common pathway after law school. It's such an education tool. What a beautiful thing for a judge to read, a concise judgment taking us all the way up to the point of now for judges that might not necessarily be in this space that much. I, you know, not that that's what it's intended for, but that is perhaps um, a, you know, a silver lining and, a, and an additional way that th this will be very useful. Um, I'm just conscious of the time, and we have 26 minutes left. So I want to ask all Lara, of you something. Could I just yeah. add something quickly yeah. um, on just this follow-on point? While we're waiting for the ICJ's opinions to come out, we do have tools that we can also rely on to urge lawyers um, to do these things that we've been asking, to advise their clients on we don't necessarily have to wait for that. Well, that would be helpful. Um, I do want to draw attention to the ABA has this policy on climate change, which you referenced early on in the 2019 resolution. And one of the things that the ABA's resolution does go into is to urge federal, uh, state, local, territorial, and tribal governments and the private sector to recognize their obligation, I'm reading from it, right, to address mm -hmm. climate change and take action to achieve the following goals. And one of those is, for instance, this because this is in US specific, reduce US greenhouse gas emissions uh, to net zero or below as soon as possible. Um, and I think one of the, the most key languages that come in with that resolution, and I just want to mention that here quickly, is that the ABA then goes on to urge lawyers to engage in pro bono activities, to aid efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to climate change, and to advise their clients on the risks and opportunities that climate change provides. So we already have, at least within the United States, and which I would love to see emulated elsewhere, this call to lawyers to do that already. You don't have to necessarily wait for that ICJ opinion while it would be helpful um, to do that. You can start in right now. Absolutely, and definitely not saying we should wait. There is no yes. time at all for that. Uh, and you're exactly right. And there are other bars that have, that have made a number of resolutions only two weeks ago. Scotland, the Law Society of Scotland is, issued a resolution um, with respect to climate change. Japan is currently focusing on it after a 2021 resolution. Um, the CCBE, which is the Continental Bars of Europe, have also done that. Um, I'm in talks with the president of the Zambian Law Association to do something similar for the Congress in Africa. It is, it is pollinating, um, but every lawyer can help pollinate it faster. Um, so, a bit of homework for all of you. Um, with that, one final question, and you've got a minute to respond. I will time you. Um, what would be your one wish? You know, we'll see each other next year, hopefully, in Baku. What would be your one wish from then till now? You go first. I and I should say, my previous panel had like three and went way over, but it's, if you can limit it to one, that would be great. Okay, I will have one minute, but I have two. Two. <laughs> it's one, Christmas. Is, one is too hard, there's so much. <laughs> but I think my first would be to see, uh, you know, either stronger language all the way up to a tr treaty as was presented here, but 
language on uh, fossil fuel phase out. I think this is probably the fundamental issue that we are dealing with right now and it's what needs to be done. So from, from stronger language in the decision that is probably being taken in those very rooms up there to, to any measures, but something on that. Second is on the climate finance bit, from the loss and damage fund, you know, to address really the most pressing issues, all the way up to the funding that is needed for the private sector to really engage in decarbonization, I think is, is really what will, as we say, move the needle of climate change to where we need to get to. That was 40 seconds, so. I will take, I will take 20 seconds to provide an update. I was just following the GST. Have we got the so text? we, the GST text is out in case anyone's interested. And it says phase out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Say that one more time. In if it's phase out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. What's the definition of inefficient fuel subsidies? <laughs> Very good question. Not something I haven't just immediate subsidies response Subsidies only. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There's, there's nothing, nothing that's direct phase out language as yet, but that's an instant response on, on GST. My one wish though is, is, um, is that we have more practicing academics and more academics who practice, uh, sorry, more practicing academics and more academics who practice. Um, the reason I say that is because I think we need more coherence between what the theory is um, that we see in the classroom and what the doctrine is that's used in the courts. And I think that right now the gap between those two in jurisdictions that do not encourage academics to practice and vice versa is far too high for the amount of implementation compliance ambition that we require to actually take place. Uh, so I would like to see a bit more of that and I'd like to see that happen a bit more within our networks and within our spaces. Uh, well, I'm gonna ask for two as well. Uh, one would be, if I have my ABA hat on, is that we continue to do things like this and continue to include more diverse bar associations on these panels to try and hear about those challenges and just continuing that, um, that trajectory. But if I take that ABA head off for a quick second and talk about it from the context of legal academia, but also as a teacher and a professor, um, one thing that I would definitely like to see is, and we've sort of been, this trend has been starting already, is with having professors who teach core courses that you, you learn in law school, contracts, torts, property, constitutional law, administrative law, also now delving into environmental law topics. And I think that would be amazing to see. And we're seeing it in, U in Australia, New Zealand, um, yeah. at my law school at Pace, we have a lot of environmental law faculty that are immersed and teaching mm -hmm. those core courses as well. And they bring in all that environmental law knowledge and sustainability mindsets and climate conscious attitudes into their teaching. Um, and then the other aspect is sort of touching on what Tejas was mentioning is uh, practice and trying to con uh, trying to teach our students when they are going into internships and practicing and thinking about the practice of um, environmental law, how does cl that climate conscious work fit into it? And really being able to identify issues when there are climate injustice issues arising, when there are climate conscious opp opportunities to dive into, being able to recognize it and then being able to know how to address them. And I think as legal, like a, legal professors, we need to be able to teach that and we need to be very cohesive in how we teach it and comprehensive and holistic about our understanding of, and working with practicing lawyers and maybe that's the point right mixing those two might do that in a much faster way okay transparency and inclusiveness so transparency in the sense of you know people need to know a bit more what's going on at cops how it works and what's the significance of it um, also transparency uh, in party's interest, but an inclusive, sorry, that wasn't very articulate, but inclusiveness, um, I want it to get to a point next year where more people know how to represent their interest in negotiations, so that's why capacity building and tools that de-simplify and, de uh, simplify and decode the process, um, but also inclusiveness in practical terms, you know, perhaps more support for developing countries and emerging economies to send more negotiators. Um, you know, caps on the cost of hotels so that they can stay nearer the venue. It seems to be less of an issue here, but it was a huge issue in Glasgow. Just other ways to make the process more inclusive and fair and transparent. I'm gonna give myself a wish. Um, echoing all of you, my wish would be for um, senior leadership across every industry and particularly in law in our bar associations in recognising that this is the justice issue of our age. Um, I think too many times we, we go out and, and, and do, do good things um, 
for it not really to be elevated at the top um, and to just get some points. And so I, I would really hope for that across the board. And certainly I see the coalition of the willing build and I'm, op I'm optimistic. Um, and I, I completely agree about needing to bring in more law associations. And so my homework for all of you is um, please look at our websites, look at the IBA, look how if you're an academic or a practicing lawyer you can get involved, look at the committees that you could potentially join. Um, I hope that the fees of it are, do allow for students, but if there is any issue, you know, please let me know um, because that is a key access issue. ABA is free membership for students. Yeah, I think so is join. the IBA. <laughs> um, and so just finally, before we take questions, I just want to give a shout out to the people that are not here but that were instrumental in making this possible from the beginning. Um, so to John Dernbach, Tracy Hester, Amy Edwards from the ABA, to Nina Pinham, from, who's a barrister in England and Wales, Alastair Cameron, who is the Climate Law Policy Lead at the Law Society of England and Wales, um, Sarah Carnegie, my boss at the Legal Policy and Research Unit, who's been absolutely brilliant in supporting this uh, and who really took that journey for us to get um, uh, observer status, um, and also to Leticia Perón Campos Mello from the OIB. She was instrumental in having Brazil sign a resolution this year, which is a roadmap for climate action for the Brazilian Bar Association, and that is just huge. Um, so amazing um, that she that she has done that. Um, and I don't want to forget anyone. No, I think that's. Um, and to our fellow uh, representative in the room, Nadia Ahmad from the ABA, who is here and who also serves as the um, in the advisory board, I think, the IBA for academics. So, uh, with that, um, I'm just going to shout out some practical tools. I hope you have your pens or your keyboards ready because I want you to Google all of these. So, we talked about Hughes Hall Climate Atlas from Cambridge, Sustainability Essentials book, John Dernbach, Net Zero Tracker. The LRI, Legal Response International, they also have an app about the Paris Agreement, which I've had on my phone for over a year, which tells you what it is, all articles. It's super useful. I met a negotiator from Malawi. She didn't know it existed, and I told her to download it. So, Thank you very much. No worries. <laughs> um, Climate Law and Governance Day, Centre for International Sustainable Development Law, Climate Law and Governance Initiative, Google them all, Google NZLA, <laughs> um, look at your local bar, have a look at their CPD list. Is there anything on climate? If not, would you like that? Tell them, contact them, use your voice. Um, legal voices, uh, for legal the voices for future. There's also Repurpose, which yep. is a new initiative yep. that incorporates and embeds indigenous technical knowledge and spiritual knowledge, which yep. is an amazing initiative. Um, and I would urge you to look at our IBA climate crisis statement from 2020. If you are having a hard time moving the dial on this, use that document other law associations have. Um, in 2014, we issued a task force report on the impacts of climate, and in 2014, one of the recommendations was an ICJ opinion. Um, so really glad that we're getting there. Um, those are only a few. I hope I didn't leave anything out, but... Yeah, become a member of WCL. Oh my God, yeah, of course. I need to do that. I need to become a member. And take the democratizing education for global sustainability and justice courses when they run. Yeah. And join our Climate Capacity Pledge Registry. Any other asks before we move to question time? I think I've already said it. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> um, we will now have 15 minutes for questions. Oh. For you to make up. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm Lisa Banda from Malawi. I'm working with the Civil Society Network on Climate Change. My question is really related to coordination between uh, advocates for climate action, climate justice, and people in the new judiciary system. Uh, I say this because in our country we had, uh, the government had put up the ban on use of thin plastics but up to now, a company that is producing this uh, got an injunction, and I would say maybe probably one year later, this, ban this injunction has not been lifted. How do we make sure that the judiciary also 
understand the importance of safeguarding the environment so that we all work together towards a common goal. And I, I say this specifically for me and the civil society advocating for climate change action. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Team, is anyone that wants to take it first? So how to match advocates for action, how to ensure that the more progressive laws being built are being actioned and that the judiciary is being educated in, in understanding why those laws are really important um, in order to better protect our environment and climate. I guess I can start really quickly. Uh, one thing that the ABA, for instance, does is there is a global program section within the ABA and this includes a rule of law initiative and part of that involves uh, engaging with countries worldwide but also in particular working with judges as well and training them, um, training lawyers, judges and government officials on that. So hopefully those kinds of, building on those kinds of um, um, projects and trying to maybe bring it to uh, where you are, where it is needed, um, so definitely con connecting there might be an option for yeah. I think Fabiano can speak to this a bit more, but the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law and the IUCN Academy on Environmental Law um, led to the birth of the Global Judicial Institute on Environment, which is run by Justice Antonio Herman Benjamin from Brazil as well. And they're really working to train judges um, specifically on environmental developments and tracking that space I think and using these networks like we've, we've all discussed different fora that are available. I think most of the fora that are mentioned across or represented across this, this panel are fora where advocates who work on climate justice issues on the ground, activists and judges are all a part of and the more that they get to interact with each other across these spaces the more I think that we achieve the ambitions that you're, you're aiming for. Yeah, no, I think uh, perhaps a first step is, is to uh, try to understand if there is a lack of capacity and, and there's so many, you know, available means of support that you can, that, that you can benefit from uh, to be able to adequately uh, bring your claims and, and make them heard. We have, for instance, here Yasmin who works with adv advocates for international development, you know, LRI, uh, so depending exactly on which specific uh, challenges you're facing, I think there is already a good, uh, a good, a number of sources out there to provide that kind of support, be it information sharing or specific capacity building or even uh, funding and, and representation. Yeah. Um, more questions? I don't know what the mics are. Oh, sorry, Maeve. Yeah. Thanks, Maeve. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Inna Ali and I'm here um, wearing three hats. <laughs> um, I'm here in my personal capacity as a climate change um, advocate. I am a, a practitioner, I'm a corporate lawyer, energy and natural resources, uh, one of the biggest law firms in Nigeria. And I am also part of the Nigerian Bar Association, um, external relations of the Women's Forum. So I have two questions, right? Um, as a lot of you are aware, Nigeria is a gas-rich country, right? We have um, a lot of transactions that deal with, um, you know, um, oil and gas and a lot of um, upcoming renewable energy as well. Now, what do law firms need to do to find a delicate balance in terms of um, advisory role and advocating for you know net zero. Nigeria has a 2060 net zero target. Now, so an, another thing is there's uh, no capacity or very minimal capacity in terms of training lawyers. So where I'm coming from, I'm I think literally the only one among a group of lawyers from Nigeria, I haven't spotted anyone or any law firm um, represented in, in COP at all. I, they might be here, but I haven't come across mm -hmm. them. Now, how do we build capacity in terms of, um, you know, adding our voices? Because Nigeria is in the global south. There's a desertification is a problem. We have flooding. We have so many issues coming up. We have um, the issues of host community, indigenous people, rice, and uh, a lot of um, places are affected by spillage and all that. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. so putting all those 
huge issues into play. What can we do as lawyers, you know, in Nigeria mm -hmm. um, to build capacity, to get the Nigerian Bar Association to come up with a resolution and to key in into just, uh, you know, moving things forward? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, great questions, and I actually think there's someone right behind you who was that you might want to meet because um, it looked like she was trying to get your attention. Um, just quickly, I'll take this to start. Um, I there are some law firms that have started to build what they call red line policies when they're looking at taking on new clients, what they would consider, particularly with respect to climate. Um, they're not public necessarily, but they do exist, and they helped form the. Um, they, they, they helped contribute to um, the Law Society of England and Wales guidance on the impact of solicitors. I would urge you to read that. Um, there was a lot of different people that put their brains together to make that happen, over 100 lawyers, and you can imagine how difficult that is for consensus. Um, so, so read that, and as far as the Nigerian Bar Association is concerned, um, the IBA recently did a gender report of Nigeria with our separate project called 50-50 um, by 2030, trying to understand gender parity in the law. Um, and there were some interesting initiatives that came out of there. But what I can do is connect you to people I'm already talking about in, in the African Congress and in different places, because I, 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 you know, if I can just be the dot connector, that would be awesome, because the work is getting done. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to come in in uh, relation to your first question and with the caveat, as I said, that I'm not, I haven't been a practicing lawyer for a long time, but I think a good entry point that I, probably lawyers across the board understand and take into account is the issue of risk, right? <laughs> Making people understand the risks presented by climate change, both the risks to operations, the, the, the risk to economic losses, but there's another type of risk that also needs to be increasingly understood, which is reputational risk. The in increasingly, people are waking up to, you know, to, to the reality of, of climate change, of biodiversity loss, of the planetary crisis at large. And there's a risk for companies, but even to the law firm itself, in being associated with activities that uh, are in line with, uh, or are not in line, sorry, with the decarbonization path, and as we might hear from the advisory opinion, that are actually illegal under the Paris Agreement. Um, I'm, I'm not a practicing lawyer either, because I'm, I'm doing my PhD at the moment, and at the moment I've taken a break from, from that. But um, I, I just want to say that I, uh, apart from the risk, I think that I just go back to the point about networks. Uh, we have in this room Dr. Nasiruddin Mohammed, who's from the University of Dubai and sitting on the far end of the room, who's also from Nigeria, who's also qualified as an advocate over there and a solicitor over there who might be able to already be one point of contact and a point of contact within the room. Um, but in, in response to the question about capacity building, Professor Damilola Olawui of the Hamid bin Khalifa mm -hmm. University um, is building capacity worldwide on sustainable development law and on energy law and environmental law within the MENA region in particular. And I. I would just urge that when capacity building efforts take place or when we try to look for, um, for ways in which we can scale up capacity and build these networks, we also look for leaders from our own countries who are elsewhere, who may not be within our home countries, but right outside and might be able to advise from the margins. Because I've seen myself as an Indian lawyer being in the UK being able to offer different advice to Indian clients than Indian lawyers within India would have. And I'm almost more empowered being outside of India as an Indian lawyer because I can act as a consultant and I'm not regulated within that capacity by um, a different set of regulations that might bind me. So I would, I would just urge that creative solution as well, potentially. I will totally echo that and say in terms of within the American Bar Association, we have a large contingent of Nigerian lawyers there as well. And you, are, you know, the membership is open. You're, you don't have to be within the US to be able to join. And you can certainly join and take advantage of that membership there as well. Um, just um, thank you very much. Okay, my name is Nena, I'm from Nigeria, and I'm really happy <laughs> to see my countryman here. So, um, I will come from the angle of young lawyers. I mean, someone on the panel made mention of building capacity for um, people from the global south, especially emerging economies and developing countries. How do we encourage young lawyers to participate more in climate negotiations and 
all that. I mean, it's something we really need to take seriously if we need our voices to actually be heard out there. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you want to go first? Or? Mm. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I think that the, the first one I would refer young people to is another one of our global, our climate law and governance global laureates for this year, global leadership award laureates for this year, which is the, the Youth Negotiators Academy and the Climate Youth Negotiators Program, which they run. Uh, which offers training specifically for youth to get involved in these negotiation processes and then helps them connect with their country's delegations so that they're able to represent them effectively. Um, of Interest is also a different program that they run that they just launched for the desertification convention as well called the Land Use Negotiators Academy. And, and that's just been launched as well and is another forum to enable um, youth, youth to get more involved within negotiations. But on the, on the broader point of capacity building, I think accessing these training courses, like, we, like we've all mentioned earlier, including um, from the Democratizing Education for Global Sustainability and Justice program at the University of Cambridge, as well as um, accessing the practical tools that Lara mentioned, I think are ways in which we can invite people to join into these networks and into these spaces where more opportunities will present themselves. I'm conscious of time, so. Uh, any other questions? Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Okay. We've got two minutes and 26 seconds. Um, yes? What, could we take them all and then rapid fire response and then we can continue talking afterwards outside. Okay. Oh, yeah. Marie Claire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's on the right. Well, thank you for an incredibly inspiring and perfect end to the unofficial law day here at the COP inside of bedroom eight, um, definitely adding momentum to the transition to spend by most of us who have now got the cop cold. <laughs> <laughs> and in, especially with the lights up there. Um, I actually just wanted to add a comment and an idea, which was that um, the 6,600 um, expressions of interest that we've received so far, that we have to choose among them to give the scholarships for the um, democratizing education courses, if we added an extra question, are you a member of the bar in your country? And if not, <laughs> would you like to start a bar committee on? <laughs> I'm just wondering whether joining up our initiatives that way so that we send people to each other. Yeah. Similarly, um, the registry, if we added one extra question, would you like to join the World Commission on Environmental Law? If so, click here. Um, it would just make so much more sense and exactly that same collaboration that's yeah. been built here at the COP, learning what each other's up to, ways to help, could just be even scaled up massively. It, it does say adding momentum to the transition, so those are two ideas. I mean, big yes for me. Um, other questions? Yeah. Yep, yep. Thank you, yes, absolutely. Hi everyone, thank you so much for your insights. It's really interesting. My name is Juliana. I'm one of the 1.4 million uh, lawyers we have in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> Obrigada. <laughs> Obrigada a você. And uh, I'm here. Uh, I, I really uh, got connected with your questions, and so it will be quite uh, similar. I'm wearing two hats here today. I am a carbon market consultant in a think tank and association lawyers called La Clima, which Fabiano is a member as well. And I'm also an associate, a senior associate at the Environmental Law Department uh, in a full service law firm in Brazil. And I don't want to be the devil's lawyer here, but I really like to hear some of your thoughts on something that I've been noticing when wearing my uh, associate, senior associate uh, hat which is sometimes I'm really glad that this is my first COP, by the way, and I'm really glad to see a lot of Brazilian attorneys here for the first time, the second time, and coming from the full uh, service law firms. However, sometimes I notice I, I'm in a place of fear that uh, the vision that the lawyers bring here will, will be more of a business perspective, which is natural for a law firm, as you may know, but sometimes uh, so uh, business-oriented mm -hmm. that gives uh, 
sometimes it puts environmental integrity aside. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, this makes me fear that uh, how could we come to law firms and show them that how important it is to understand the international regime, to understand what Paris Agreement is, to bring it to Brazil and how to apply it and to help bring knowledge to mm -hmm. Brazil uh, private sector as lawyers, corporate lawyers, instead of just stimulate speculation, financial speculation on uh, things that should be environmental integrity mm -hmm. at base. Thank yep. you. Um, well, two-second answer quickly. Uh, firstly, look at the OIB resolution if you haven't already, and then think about it from a perspective of regulation. Like, if that's something that OIB says we all need to look at, then I would say we as in the global community, but you as a Brazilian lawyer, then it takes away any argument about it being about uh, um, value signalling or virtue signalling. It's just comp climate competency. Like, are you giving appropriate legal advice? It's just as simple as that. I know, but happy to continue this conversation we, off, yeah, uh, we've offline, Yeah, we've got to exit. Yeah. Can I just say thank you so yeah. much to everyone coming. Let's keep talking outside. Thank you so and much. And Law Day for COP. Law Day 2020, <laughs> 20, COP 29.